The original Sony PlayStation just got an internal digital-to-digital -digital HDMI mod from the same creators of the DC Digital and Time Sleuth, Dan and Kristoff. This allows for the highest quality video currently possible from the original PS1 and adds some really cool features. Let's check it out and see how it works. I need to start out by saying if you're looking for a great experience from original PlayStation hardware, the easiest and cheapest thing you could do is just pick up an old CRT. It might not be the fanciest solution, but PS1 games were designed for the look of CRTs in mind, and even the usually noisy look of composite video blends the graphics really well. Especially anything with dither blending, which is pretty much most of the PlayStation library. If your goal is to game on a flat screen, there's some pretty easy plug and play options out there. You could pick up a Rad 2X HDMI cable for the easiest option, but you could also combine a high quality cable with a scaler like the RetroTINK products or open source scan converter. As long as you stay away from the garbage knockoff products, they'll all be a great experience. That being said, if you want the sharpest, cleanest solution possible using original hardware and you have a compatible PlayStation, the PS1 Digital is absolutely the best choice. So let's dig in deep and see what this thing can do. Before installing, you'll need to find a PlayStation with either a PU18 or 20 motherboard, which are generally found in 5X and 7X series consoles in both NTSC and PAL regions. It won't work with any other revision at the moment though. Also, the installation will take the place of the serial port, which is only used for link cable support. Dan and Kristoff hope to add link cable functionality via Wi-Fi in future firmware updates, which is a much better solution overall in my opinion. Honestly, I love the placement of the HDMI port here, and I really thought it made for a factory look, plus it makes this a no-cut mod. And for the record, this doesn't affect the parallel port at all, so Asayo is still compatible. The XStation ODE is also compatible, and the console I used to capture all this footage has one installed. Even after finding a compatible console, you might want to consider having a professional install it for you, as the installation itself is a bit tricky. One of the creators, Dan, has a video showing how to install it, and Voltar recently posted a video on it as well. Overall, the consensus is that it's a bit harder than the DC Digital HDMI mod, and not something a casual modder would probably be comfortable with. I highly recommend watching those videos before purchasing, and if you're uncomfortable doing the mod yourself, try to find professional modders to do the job for you. Once the installation is complete, boot to the PS1 dashboard and enter the PS1 digital menu by hitting L2, R2, Start, X, and Square all at the same time. As a note, you won't be able to enter the menu during boot screens, only during times when normal controller operation would be allowed. Once you're in the menu, use the interface to connect it to a 2.4 GHz wireless network and check for firmware updates. As this is a new product, you should expect a few firmware updates around launch time, but it's been really stable the whole time I've been testing it. If the software finds an update, back out and download it, then back out again and install it. It would have been easier if this was all under one menu, but I guess this gives you full control over the whole process. After it's all done, reboot the console and re-enter the menu to select resolution. The two lower resolution options are VGA and 480p, which are similar but have a slightly different aspect ratio. In almost all cases, if you were looking for 480p output, you'd want to select VGA, but if you have any issues, the other option is there. Next, you could choose either 960p or 1080p. My personal favorite is the 960p mode, as it uses nearest neighbor integer scaling to double the image, then your TV scales it the rest of the way to its native resolution. This mode looks awesome on both my TVs, and the combination of smooth and sharp scaling seems to be what I prefer. Not all TVs and monitors are compatible with 960p, so there's a 1080p option that puts the same 960p window in a 1080p frame. It won't fill the screen top to bottom the way 960p will, but it's compatible with all TVs and it does produce a slightly sharper image. As a note, 720p support might be added in a future firmware, and that would allow 100% compatibility with all TVs, as well as fill the screen top to bottom. 
To be honest, there's no right answer here. Just choose what looks best to your eyes that's also compatible with your TV. Okay, now that we have the basics set up, let's see what else this thing can do. Now, while you could just set your resolution and start playing, I highly recommend taking a moment to go through the advanced settings because there's some pretty awesome stuff in there. Let's start from the top. For RGB color space, I'd normally leave that on auto unless you know for sure your equipment requires a specific mode. My main TV and capture cards all use the full RGB color range, so I leave mine at full. The color expansion should be left at auto unless there's a specific game that has issues. I think this was more of an issue with some Dreamcast games, but probably not something you'd need to worry about with PS1. Gamma Adjust is an interesting way to deal with games that are notoriously dark. Lower the gamma to increase brightness and raise it to darken. I guess PlayStation game developers even realized this was an issue since some games added a brightness chart that helps you tweak your TV settings so you could tell what's supposed to be a dark part of the game and what's just a blurry mid-90s 3D mess. Force Mode is a pretty incredible feature that pretty much solves the resolution switching issue for games like Chrono Cross or Dino Crisis. Setting it to 240p applies a weave deinterlacing to the 480i menu screens to give it a 240p look, but it also buffers a few lines of video to spoof your target device into thinking the PlayStation never switches resolutions at all. That means there's zero dropouts when switching between modes with this feature turned on. Alternatively, here's what happens when that mode is off and the resolution switches to 480i when the menu is toggled. The blue screen is signifying my capture card losing signal. It's still a very fast transition, but not as good as with forced mode turned on. There's a forced 480i mode as well, but I'm not aware of any games with 480i gameplay and 240p menus. I guess it's there if you need it. Overall, I'd only suggest toggling this mode while you're using resolution switching games, as it buffers a few lines of video to make that happen. It's probably still zero lag, as I'll show later, but it's better to just leave it off and be safe. The next thing to talk about are the deinterlacing options, and you have some interesting choices. Most importantly, always leave deinterlacing turned on unless you specifically need to send interlaced video to your device. Many capture cards have issues with 480i, and most TVs end up adding a ton of lag to the signal, as I've shown in many previous videos. A low lag TV like this will only have around 4 milliseconds of lag with all progressive scan signals, but will have about 2 frames of lag in game mode with interlaced signals, and much more than that if you weren't in game mode. Which deinterlacing to use is an interesting choice though. I always leave mine on Weave, since every time I boot the PlayStation, I don't want the 480i BIOS screens to flicker. In-game is a different story though, since Weave deinterlacing creates a comb effect that drives some people crazy. This will only happen when there's movement though, which is why I suggest it for getting rid of flicker during boot, and why it's used for games with 480i menus in forced mode. Alternatively, Bob deinterlacing provides a shaky look to it, but with no combing artifacts at all. This is the same type of deinterlacing the OSSC and RetroTink products use, so it's probably a familiar look to anyone who's used those devices. Motion adaptive deinterlacing will be added to a future firmware update, which is an interesting option. You won't get the flicker of Bob deinterlacing, but you might still get some combing artifacts like you see with Weave. Here's an example of GBS Control's motion adaptive deinterlacing, and the PS1 Digital should look somewhere between this and the FrameMeisters. Unfortunately, this type of deinterlacing usually adds around a frame of lag, while the other two don't add any lag at all, but it'll still be a great choice for certain games, or for streaming. Now, I don't normally show a lot of footage of scan lines in these videos, because internet compression absolutely ruins the way they look, and it doesn't look anything close to the way they do in real life on your TV, but I think the PS1 Digital presents a few pretty cool scenarios in which you might really want to use them. So let's give it a shot, but just keep that in mind when you're watching this video that they're not going to look the same as they will on your TV. So just start out by going into the menu, toggle the scan lines in the menu, and select the intensity. Zero is the darkest, and 256 is the lightest. You could select thickness, but thin always seems to look better to me. Then you could adjust the odd and even pixel orientation if you'd like. Now when you combine these scan lines with Bob deinterlacing, they kinda help mask the flicker, and I imagine some people might enjoy this look. 
but turn them on when weave deinterlacing is used, and things get really impressive. There's no flicker at all, and the scan lines mask the combing effect. I think this is one of those rare moments that artificial scan lines really do add to the experience, if you don't mind the look. Remember that you could always turn the gamma down to add brightness if the scan lines make it too dark. I suggest toggling all of these settings to find out what works best for each game. Maybe just weave deinterlacing by itself is fine for you, or maybe you'll like it with scan lines. Either way, I'm glad there's options here, and please remember that scan lines will never look right across the internet. They'll always look better in person than you see here. The last feature of the PS1 Digital I'd like to show is the HQ2X filter, which adds a smoothing effect to the image that might be a big help for 3D graphics. Here's Ridge Racer to show some basic examples. First, we have the direct 960p output. Now we have HQ2X Stage 1 turned on. This adds the smoothing filter during the 240p to 480p transition, then the PS1 Digital scales it to 960p. Depending on your preference, this might be too smooth, but it does a great job smoothing out the jagged edges and blending in all the noise on the road. Stage 2 adds the filtering between the 480p to 960p transition, and it has less of an effect. Stage 2 is, of course, only available if your console is in either 960p or 1080p mode. While I thought Ridge Racer looked pretty good with the Stage 1 filter on, it seems to blend the characters' faces a bit too much in other games. I guess it's all a trade-off, though. You either get smooth textures that blend nicely, or sharpness. It's definitely something you'll want to set on a per-game basis. The backgrounds in 2D games blend really nicely with the Stage 1 filter on, but I really don't like how it makes the characters look. Stage 2 seems okay, though. It blends the dithering a bit, like you could see up in the sky, but doesn't really hurt the look of the characters at all. Now, the look of all three of these will completely depend on your TV scaler as well. In fact, Stage 1 might be best used if you set the PS1 Digital to VGA and let your TV scale the rest of the way. Each TV is different though, so I highly recommend messing around with some games to see which look best for you. Also, as a note, some odd resolution games aren't supported with HQ2X yet, but those will be added with a firmware update in the future. Okay, now that we know what to expect, let's take a look at how the PS1 Digital compares to other solutions out there. Let's start with the Rad 2X, as it's my next favorite choice for the PlayStation, just because of its simplicity. You definitely lose some sharpness and brightness with the Rad 2X, but I think as a plug-and-play solution, it does its job really well, with, once again, zero lag added. The Rad 2X's smoothing filter works really similar to the PS1 Digital's Stage 1 filter, and is identical to the filter in all of the RetroTINK products. Once again, how your TV scales 480p content will totally determine how this ends up looking for you, so your results may vary. And lastly, here's the Stage 2 filter versus the Rad 2X. I really like the filters on both products, but which ones to use, if any, really depends on the game you're playing. I'd definitely give it a try on either product across different styles of games to see if you like it. Once the PS1 Digital was announced, many people in the retro gaming world wanted to know how it compared to the open source scan converter, and that's a tricky question to answer. If you're someone who uses the OSSC in generic mode, the PS1 Digital will look better, but more importantly than that, the OSSC doesn't have fast resolution switching, weave deinterlacing, and smoothing filters like I showed before. If those features are important to you, that would immediately make the PS1 Digital a better choice. If you're someone who takes the time to dial in optimal timings for the PS1, the OSSC will pretty much be as sharp as the PS1 Digital, but due to how the OSSC scales the image, the aspect ratio will now be off and slightly different for each of the 10-ish resolutions the PS1 supports. Also, figuring out which game runs at which resolution and then setting phase for every single one can be a giant pain. I just posted a video that shows this in detail, so please check it out for more info. Don't get me wrong, I love the OSSC, I'm just trying to explain how much the PS1 Digital is accomplishing, as you never need to worry about any of this stuff. Just set your resolution like I showed before, and start gaming. 
So I guess the best way to answer the question is the OSSC does an awesome job, but the PS1 Digital does everything the OSSC can do and more specifically tailored to the PlayStation library. One question I get every single time an HDMI device is released is how would it look with the M cable? Honestly, in all my testing, it almost never adds anything useful to the game, but I wanted to be thorough in this review. First, it didn't really work in either 1080p or 960p modes, adding interference to the screen, just like it did with my OSSC tests. Next, while it did add a nice smoothing filter to the PS1 Digital's VGA mode, it looked really close to the Stage 1 filter of the PS1 Digital in 960p or 1080p mode. There certainly isn't any drastic difference, and this obviously isn't worth buying when the PS1 Digital can already do the same thing. Combining the M cable and the PS1 Digital's HQ2X filter ended up double blurring the image, and I definitely didn't like the look. While I have seen the M cable look cool for consoles like the Xbox, I really wouldn't recommend it for any console older than that, and the PS1 Digital is no different. If you already own an M cable or M Classic, it might be helpful if your display isn't compatible with the PS1 Digital's 960p mode. If that's the case, try setting the PS1 Digital to VGA mode and running it through one of those. I absolutely would not buy one just for that reason, but if you do end up using it, I tested both of those and proved that neither add any lag whatsoever. Okay, so this wouldn't feel like the Retro RGB channel unless I include a lag test. Here's the PS1 Digital set to 480p, running through a lagless digital to analog converter into a multi-format CRT. I also have a second CRT hooked up to the PlayStation's normal AV output, which is completely unaffected by the HDMI kit. All analog outputs still work fine, including dual output like you see here. To test lag, here's 4K60 footage slowed down showing that Mega Man is shooting at the exact same frame on both monitors. 60 frame per second cameras can only really detect frame by frame, so I also took footage with a 960 frame per second camera as well to verify the results. That footage looks pretty ugly, but shows some interesting results. The beam of light that's passing from top to bottom is the CRT drawing one line at a time, completing the full frame. If I had a faster camera, you'd even be able to see it draw from left to right as well. While this mode confirms that the bullet appears from Mega Man's gun on the same frame on both monitors, it also shows something pretty cool. The beam on the left from the analog output is starting about 2 milliseconds before the digital output on the right. This makes sense since the PS1 digital needs to buffer a few lines to make the signal fully compatible with modern TV refresh rates. But remember, this is lines buffered, not frames. 2 milliseconds of lag is absolutely undetectable in any scenario, so I guess this means the PS1 Digital has about 2 milliseconds of lag, which in my opinion should just be considered zero. I also wanted to test both deinterlacing methods, so here's Bob deinterlacing showing the kick happening on the same frame, just like in 240p mode. Switching to 960 frame per second footage shows the same delay in the beam of light that we saw before, proving that even with the interlacing turned on, the lag is only about 2 milliseconds. And once again, please consider that zero. Now let's switch over to weave deinterlacing, just to be sure. Just like with Bob deinterlacing, the kicks appear at the exact same frame on both monitors, and the slow motion footage confirms the same delay. Hopefully someday I could upgrade my slow motion camera and be able to demonstrate stuff like this in much more detail. I also wanted to test the potential for lag added in the Force 240p mode. It's definitely less than a frame, but you could see more of a delay between the two beams than you did earlier. Dan and Kristoff said the buffering in Force 240p mode could vary between 0 and 1 frame, but it looked like about half a frame in all my tests. Half a frame should still be undetectable, but that's why I only recommend using this mode if you need it. If you're playing a game that doesn't have multiple modes in-game, there's no reason to risk any lag being added at all. So in conclusion, I really think the PlayStation 1 Digital is the best way to play original PlayStation hardware on flat panel TVs. 
Now, by saying that this is the best doesn't take away from any of the other options I've shown. Some of those scalers still do a great job, and I am a giant fan of just using composite video on a cheap CRT you might still be able to find on the side of the road. But if your goal is to play on a flat panel and you want the best with all of the options that are tailored directly to the PlayStation's library, this one's still gonna be top dog. Now, there are a couple of alternatives out there. You could play PlayStation 1 games on a PlayStation 3, but I've always had terrible luck with that. Some games look really soft on disc, but the PlayStation network downloads are sharp, or vice versa. But if you already own a PlayStation 3 and you have a PlayStation 1 library, they're certainly worth just trying to see how you like it. But overall, this is guaranteed to be a better option. There is, of course, software emulation, which, depending on how you choose to go about it, could be a pretty good option. I've been testing the Polymega, which works fine, but it, at the moment, at least, it doesn't offer anything over what the PS1 Digital does, and it is software emulation, so you're going to definitely get some lag involved in that. And I've also tried testing some other software emulation for PC, and while I was able to get video that looked incredible, 480i rendered in progressive scan, the different textures smoothed and all that, it was never consistently easy to play, and it always felt like I was gaming on a PC emulator. You always had to use a mouse and keyboard to set things up and kind of fumble around with a controller and see if you can get it working. And if you're the type of person that likes that, that's an absolutely awesome way to experience it. But once again, just to circle back around, if you just want original hardware on a flat panel TV with all the options available today, the PS1 Digital is definitely the best choice for you. So hopefully this video answered all of your questions. Check out the main post as well as all the other info on RetroRGB.com to be pointed in the right direction for any other questions you might have. And who knows, maybe I'll do another follow-up video at some point in the future comparing different software emulation solutions and see if any really hold up to the PS1 Digital.